May 2015. The Secular Party wins a majority in the UK general election. June. Bishops and rabbis are removed from the House of Lords. July. Her Majesty the Queen officially gives up her position as head of the Church of England. August. Churches start paying taxes. September. Faith schools have all state funding withdrawn. October. Legislation is passed making it illegal to circumcise a child, though consenting adults can still have the procedure performed by a plastic surgeon. Should the government be secular? Any government, that is. I was just using mine as an example. Before we start, you should know that this is something I have a personal opinion on. I will do my best to be impartial, but it is a subject that is close to my heart. So, what is secularism? It is a state in which nobody is punished or privileged by the government for their religious belief or lack of it. It is not the total removal of religion from a society, it is not the government changing religious doctrine, and it is not the same as atheism. You could be a Christian secularist, or a Muslim secularist, or anything you like. It just means the total separation of church and state. Why might somebody want that? Why, for instance, did Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Paine go to such lengths to make sure the country they were helping found was secular? Well, because an argument for secularism can be pretty easily derived from one basic moral principle. If you've watched a few Philosophy Tube episodes, you might remember Kant's famous aphorism, ought implies can. If you ought to do something morally, it must be the case that you can do it. And that's just a very formal way of framing something, which is pretty intuitive. It's not okay to punish somebody for something they can't help but do, like, for instance, their skin colour. Similarly, it's not okay to privilege somebody for something they have no control over, like, for instance, their skin colour. Note that this applies to morally significant punishment or privilege. It's not okay to say that somebody is morally bad or worth less because of something they can't help but do. But you might still give somebody a reward for something they can't help, like, for instance, in a beauty contest. The point is, you're not privileging the winners of beauty contests in a morally significant way. You're not saying that they are better people, or that they're more suited to running the country, or giving moral advice, or whatever. Now that we've got that basic moral principle, note that people don't choose their religion. Nobody gets up and says, I think I'll be Catholic today, I was Muslim yesterday and I'll be Sikh next week, but today I believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ. I mean, no, that's just not how that works. Most people get their religion from their parents, and if you pick up or abandon a religion, it's not out of flippant choice. Maybe it's because you think you've had some kind of experience, or because the force of a rational argument compels you. You can choose whether or not you act religiously, whether you wear certain clothes or go to church or abide by certain dietary restrictions, but you cannot actually choose to believe or not believe. And this is why a lot of countries have freedom of religion. It would be wrong to punish or privilege somebody on the grounds of their faith because they can't actually control that. Although they might be able to pretend that they can, it would be as unfair as age or race or sex discrimination. So, from that basic moral principle, we have derived a moral requirement for the government to neither punish nor privilege anybody based on their religion or lack of it. Total religious freedom, and all religions free equally. In other words... So you can't say that somebody gets to help run the country just because they believe in God. Your faith school doesn't get state funding because the government can't say it officially endorses your faith. Your church pays taxes because everybody else has to pay taxes. The head of state can't officially have ties to any particular religion. And the government can't accept God says so as a reason to cut off part of a child without their consent. And now some arguments against secularism. Of course, you could reject the basic moral principle on which that argument is founded, the ought implies can principle, and say that it is okay to punish or privilege somebody for something they have no control over. If you were able to do that, then this particular argument for secularism would fail. The existence of God would be another good argument against secularism. If God exists, and if it has a plan for us, and if we need to be following that plan, and if only certain people are aware of or are capable of understanding that plan, then it does make sense for those people to be running the country. Those are some pretty big ifs, though. You're going to have to do a lot of work to show that they're true. Tradition. Lots of countries have a history of religious political dominance. In fact, I think apart from the USA, most do. If your nation's religious identity is important to you, then you might not want to see that divorced from the actual governance of the nation. Assuming, of course, that your country does have a clear religious identity. 
I don't think the traditional argument is particularly strong. It basically boils down to this is the way things have always been done, therefore this is the way they should be done. And I'm all for tradition, it brings people closer together and it makes them happy, like turkey on Christmas Day. But I don't think that tradition is enough of a reason to keep doing something if that thing is actually bad. You might think that morality is revealed by God, and governments need to be officially tied to religion in order to be moral. Again, I'm not particularly persuaded by this, because as Plato showed thousands of years ago, God cannot be the source of morality. See the Euthyphro Dilemma for details. History. People like to point to countries like Soviet Russia and Nazi Germany and say, look, that is where secular governments will take you. In actual fact, though, both of those governments practiced religious persecution, albeit in different forms, which is the opposite of secularism. What do you guys think? Should the government be secular? In particular, are there any arguments that you think I've missed out? Have I been impartial enough? Send me your questions, comments, queries, and comments underneath the video on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, or by email. The votes for this episode did swing in favour of this one, but there was some really good preemptive discussion of the other topic in the comments section, so I think the next episode will be about should we support the troops? Leave a like if you enjoy the show, and for more philosophical videos, please subscribe. There were some really good comments underneath there. There were some good comments. There are some good comments underneath the last episode. Let's see what the philosophers had to say, have to say about does time pass? You topos, you could experience nostalgia in a B universe in which time didn't pass. So experiencing nostalgia is not an argument for the passage of time. Kelly or Richard Weddle and Owen Birch 22, you could in fact get increasing entropy in a B universe. Entropy is a measure of disorder, so you could have more disorder at time t than you had at time t minus 1 without there being an objective present. GMC, Kiara Miller, and Hunter Tony 56, you could get an account of change in a B universe too. You could have a property at time t minus 1 that you did not have at time t without there being any passage of time or any objective present. Some people are really pushing this idea that certain phenomena or certain experiences support A theory. The question you need to ask when you're doing that is, could this happen in a B universe? If the answer is yes, then it doesn't support A theory. Ilian Bobayev said that the passage of time is a necessary prerequisite for experience. Back that ass up! Brad Younger, the question how fast does time pass has actually been discussed by philosophers and it's a bit of an interesting one. Personally, I'm inclined to think it's kind of a dodgy question, because if you want to know how fast something's moving, then you're asking how much distance does it cover in space in a given time. And if time does exist, then it's not really the sort of thing that moves through space. Like, you couldn't say time passes at one meter per second, so it's kind of a little bit of a dodgy question, I think. Harry Hollingworth, uh, not particularly. My childhood heroes of choice were um, mainly the animated Spider-Man and the animated X-Men series. Superman just lends himself quite nicely to certain philosophical puzzles, and he's a fairly well-recognised symbol. Ors of a Patriarch asked, Does B-theory mean that the future is set? Good question. Kinda looks that way, doesn't it? That's all the time we've got in this episode. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!